Okay. Uh, Shannon, do you guys want to do a, are you guys doing a formal start to this? As I sure. sit here. Let's, let's start the meeting with Nathaniel. I think there's <laughs> way too many people to do our normal introductions. <laughs> so okay. let's just um, go right to the presentation. Excellent. Well, I'm going to um, give the, the screen to Jeremy. Uh, Jer oh, I see Jeremy's on here and he's going to do a brief introduction on the, the Creek Ridge County Park um, and kind of set up the stage for my presentation. And then I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to pin Jeremy. Um, I don't know if every, I'm not savvy enough on Zoom to know if that works for everyone or just me. But uh, Jeremy, if you want to take the show and um, yeah, I'll let you kick it off. Yeah. So I'll uh, start off. I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of background about Creek Ridge in case there's uh, some people that don't know. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. We're fine. Um, so, and, and I wanted to tell about how we got to this uh, point and got to this assessment. So Creek Ridge became our uh, second county park in uh, 1992. Uh, contains right around 112 acres, uh, varying habitat. And, uh, you know, we've been doing uh, natural resource work on most of our county parks, but hadn't done much at Creek Ridge just due to lack of funding available. Uh, honestly, though, uh, this one is probably some of the most critical issues just due to the, uh, you know, Trail Creek running through there, habitat, you know, sensitive wetland habitats, uh, multiple, many uh, adjacent landowners, uh, not like some of our other parks that aren't surrounded by houses, and then just high visitation. So the more people that come in, the more uh, potential issues you can have with natural resource management. Um, however, we really didn't know the extent of what was needed there until, so we wanted to get this assessment done before trying to do just some haphazard, you know, shotgun type management. Um, so in, 19, or in 2019, among several other requests, we requested funds from the Cool Spring Township Trustee Board uh, to, conduct, to, to conduct this assessment and uh, perform quite a bit of invasive work actually. Um, so we got some of that done too. They, they graciously donated uh, funds for that and all of the projects we asked for. And um, that's when we hired Nathaniel and Orbis to, to do the work. So just wanted to thank the Cool, cool Spring Township Trustee Board uh, for their continued support of Creek Ridge. This isn't the first time they've helped us out over there with some projects. So. I uh, wanted to, to, to thank them and, and definitely thank Nathaniel for his uh, dedication to the project. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Nathaniel. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and we can get this kicked off. Uh, let's see here. Do you guys see a beautiful picture with the, the title page? I see some nodding. Good, good. Um, just housekeeping quick. If you have questions as I'm talking, we're going to have a little bit of time afterwards. Um, so just drop it in the comments and uh, we'll kind of go through those and or just wait till the end to ask a question. Um, I want to start by saying that this is incredible time we live in that I can sit here in, a, in my own home and share this presentation with you digitally on a platform like this. Uh, we live in an incredible time. And as I say often in my presentations, uh, the human animal is an incredible species that we create this temperate, temperature moderated rooms that we're in. And we create this, this technology that we can, we can talk to each other and share with each other on things like this. So Creek Ridge County Park is a cool park. I've, I've, been there a couple times prior to this um, this study, and I'm very thankful to to Jeremy for bringing me onto this project. Um, and uh, in setting it up, I pulled uh, Matt Beatty. Matt Beatty helped me with this. He did some of the bird monitoring with me, so he was walking around helping me out. And whenever you hear or see a bird, he'd write it down. And what we try to do was create a ecological baseline assessment for the Laporte County Parks which then gives them the ability to, to create management plans and to build off the foundation that we set for them. Um, Creek Ridge County Park, again, is like 112-ish acres. Uh, it, it's, um, I think Jeremy, did you, maybe he said this, but it's 
there's a lot of people that come through this park. It's a very busy park. Uh, there's a frolfing course. If anyone knows what frolfing is, frisbee golf. Uh, and it's, it's quite fun. It's a nice little course, especially when it's, when it's raining and it's all wet. Um, so if you've not been out there, I'd highly recommend a trip over and walk the trails, maybe go fishing in, in Trail Creek there. So without further ado, let's get, let's get going into the natural features inventory of Creek Ridge County Park. Did that work? Nope. Ah, there we go. So one of the first things that we do when we go out is we delineate the plant communities. Um, and then we do multiple visits every year and we write down all of the plant species that we observe. Um, if there's insects, we, it's not a, it's, it's mostly uh, fur vascular plants that we're looking at. But if we see an insect, a butterfly, uh, birds or something of the like, we note that as well just so then there's an understanding of what's going on here. And for plant communities, we delineated out 10 different communities or assemblages uh, with the most common being the dry music upland forest. And we'll get into these very briefly for the sake of time. And then we'll get into some fun species and such. Uh, here's kind of a, 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 a graph so you can see where the, um, where the acreage shook out. Uh, there's, it's hard to delineate some of these communities because there's overlap. And in natural communities, just like species, sometimes don't follow our, our descriptions very well, and they don't fit into our boxes as well as I would like them to. So some of these communities, uh, which we'll go into in a little more detail, um, are kind of hodgepodge from, from an actual described community pieced together with another community to fit this type better. Uh, and if that doesn't make sense, hopefully as we go through this, it'll start making more sense. So this is the map. Of, of Creek Ridge um, and I want you to memorize it so then I don't have to keep going back to it. So visually memorize this map if you can. So what you see here are these grades and these, the A through E. And um, A is pristine remnant uh, plant community habitat. We don't really see that here. It, it is a disturbed area, but we do have some, the ravines are very nice, uh, a lot undisturbed. We have a lovely sedge meadow fen system that's that's pretty undisturbed believe it or not it's it's pretty amazing but then we also have something called the successional woods uh which is that black uh darker color there and that's that's a a um a assemblage in flux and we'll talk about that with some pictures so just so you kind of have an idea on on um on what what we were looking at when we're mapping out these plant communities and then when we see pictures you can kind of try to visualize it so we're gonna start with the dry music upland uh, forest type. And this type is, um, it's, it's, a, uh, it, it's actually, I think the most prevalent community type in Indiana. Uh, it's driven by fire, it's maintained by fire, wind gap, um, uh, insect outbreaks, pathogens. Um, so so it's, it's dominated by, by like oaks, hickories, um, it's, uh, and it's a little drier. So, so on the top of these slopes, we have, we have some mesic areas. Um, so it's a little wetter areas and dry mesic. So the ground's a little drier, uh, the, in the, the areas that have a lower grade, and this is kind of the boring stuff. We'll get to the fun stuff in a bit. So the areas with the lower grades, um, we see a lot more maples. And the reason we see a lot more maples coming in is, is because there's not fire that's going through these systems and these systems, in part rely on, on fire, that, that level of disturbance. Um, some of the areas, especially along the interstate, so if we saw, I'm gonna go back real quick. You can see that's I-94 running right by it. See the, the, the interstate there? So the areas by the interstate um, are, are a little more disturbed. Uh, and it makes sense because whenever you get these edge habitats, you may get some of these edge species. And a lot of the invasive species that we have, like honeysuckle, uh, the Asiatic bush honeysuckle uh, really likes those edge habitats. And I, I'd be uh, remiss not to talk about the slopes because the slopes are kind of the, the beauty in these systems. So historically, you can see the top of the dry mesic forests were cleared uh, decades ago, many decades ago. But on the slopes, they have larger trees, more stable communities. Um, and uh, sometimes more open because, because they're facing, like the south-facing slopes uh, especially. Uh, this is more of an east-facing slope. 
and this is cool because it has these dry mesic species and then it has this seep, this, this wet seep coming out. And that's why you see these big leaf things are skunk cabbage. The big leaf things that you see there are skunk cabbage. And above it, you maybe see some sassafras trees growing over here. It looks like a white oak. Um, and then, uh, and then some blueberry bush over, I don't know how clear the picture is on mine, it's nice and clear, but you can see some blueberry going there. And then you see these, this skunk cabbage. And then earlier in the season, you see marsh marigold, Celta palustris. Um, so these seeps kind of add this really cool diversity to these slopes. And Carrick's albacans, um, for anyone that's a sedge head in here a little bit. Then we have the mesic upland forest. This is a multi-generational system. It, um, it usually is protected from excessive fire and, um, and uh, evaporation. So, so it's a little more moist. It's again, it's mesic. So mesic means, I guess I should define these words I'm talking about. So mes dry mesic is dry. It's more or less dry. You can have dry forest, but this dry mesic is dry. Mesic is kind of dry, kind of wet, kind of in between there. Uh, wet mesic is it's more wet. And, uh, and this is a very brief description of this. And then wet is of course very wet. So music is, it's, it's, a, little, it's a little wet. Uh, and what you get here is you get a lot more sugar maples, you get um, tulip trees, uh, some spice bush, especially in the a little bit damper areas. And then you get a more spring ephemeral showcase. And here we have the large flower trillium, uh, trillium grandiflorum. Uh, you have some may apple in here. Uh, it's a little bit richer soil. Um, and then here we have at Creek Ridge, and this is off the boardwalk. So in the spring, this is a beautiful show. Do uh, you have a transition between the the floodplain and the the mesic upland? And you have some some um, uh, cool honeysuckle, some native honeysuckles, which we'll talk about in a little later, and uh, viburnum prunifolium. Um, and anyway, so this is this is a mesic upland forest. And then we have the successional woods, which we talked about briefly at the beginning. Uh, and this is a, a, um, a, a plant assemblage. So there's no grade on this because it's not mature enough. It's kind of in flux again. Um, so it primarily occurs on mesic to wet mesic conditions. So it's a little wetter here. Uh, the frolfing course goes through a lot of this. So if you're out there playing Frisbee golf or frolf, um, uh, it's, I just like saying froth. It, if you're all on mute, you can say froth <laughs> to yourself. And uh, yeah, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. Uh, if you don't Frisbee golf, that's a lot of fun too. Um, even if you're not good, you don't have to be good to throw a Frisbee and get it stuck in a tree. Um, but so this is the successional, uh, the successional woods. And I'm going to keep plowing through this. This is a wet floodplain forest. So a wet floodplain forest, this is doing its job right now uh, in this picture Trail Creek was flooded and the floodplain forest is doing what it does over the bank flooding. Um, in high, high water uh, seasons, um, you could lose some trees. So there's more of an open canopy usually in the system. Uh, there's, uh, and then with ash die off too, we have more of an open canopy, um, but so usually dominated by silver maples, by uh, ash trees, fraxinus, and then um, box elders also come in and try to exploit the disturbance. Because it's a system built on disturbance, you also get a lot of non-native stuff trying to sneak in as well. Um, but it is a, a, a system that is, that is built on disturbance. Um, so this is, this is a floodplain. Again, it's over the bank flooding. It's a system that relies on that. And then we have the, the wet floodplain emergent marsh. So in Indiana's classification, we would call this probably just a marsh. And the reason I called it a wet floodplain emergent marsh is because it is influenced by those flooding events, those over the bank flooding events. Um, there's usually standing water in the system. Um, it's graminoid dominated. So it's dominated by grass -like, like plants. And and I hope you guys aren't falling asleep yet because we will have a little fun here with some of the species. But this is, this is just to put the context in place. Uh, and, most of this marsh is the, the hybrid uh, cattail, um, Typha glauca. Uh, however, on the fringes you have, and this is a picture of the fringe where you have um, American sweet flag, uh, which is um, a, a beautiful um, marsh species. And then you have more sedges. You have things like Carextricta, the tussock sedge, the tussock sedge. And so this is, again, you do have some nice flowering plants there as well, but 
Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Let's keep going. Let's get through these communities. We're almost there. There's Matt. There's a picture of Matt in one of my favorite places out there. It's the Sedge Meadow Fen. So uh, Fen is kind of a very broad term that I just put in there because there's groundwater influence in the Sedge Meadow and that uh, and there's over the bank flooding um, here too on high flooding events. So not as frequently as that wet floodplain forest, but like that flooding event that I took a picture of, there was, it was, the Sedge Meadow was flooded out too. That was a very high, high uh, water event. This Sedge Meadow is fairly nice. There's very few invasive species in there. There is some inclusions of marsh rose, Rosa palustris, and uh, some um, Salix discolor, pussy willow in there. Uh, but overall, it's pretty open. There's a nice mix of forbs. It's dominated mostly by Carex stricta is the dominant sedge, the tussock sedge. And there's some big tussocks, some big old tussocks, which shows the age of, of that, of that uh, habitat, which is really cool. There's a lot of uh, butterflies out there as well. Um, we, didn't, we, didn't, uh, we didn't dig around too much for snakes and such, um, but there's, there's underneath these hummocks and within these systems, uh, there's a lot of wildlife that's, that's using it. And uh, on the fringes is lake sedge, Carex lacustris, which is important later, we'll talk about why. And then we have a circumneutral riverside seep. So a circumneutral seep is those seeps that you see on the side of slopes that are usually shaded and it's just skunk cabbage. And it's, if you step on it, you sink. So you don't step on it. It's kind of smells a little bit oftentimes. Um, but uh, this is a little different because, and I was trying to find a name for it. And, and um, the best thing I could come up with circumneutral riverside seep. And the reason it's it's that is because it's it is even though it has these seep qualities, um, so it has it has species like skunk cabbage, um, even nasturtium, which isn't native but it's there, uh, Chrysosplenium, and so forth. It also has some of these fen species, uh, and that could be in part due to some silt deposits from over the bank flooding. Over the bank flooding causes it. So then we have this fen sedge meadow system within the seepage system. Uh, so the best definition I could fit into it was a circumneutral riverside seep. Um, but anyway, that's that's really cool. In this spot in particular, I was out with Jeremy and I asked him why they had these big orange cones out here. And these are the stories that make the presentations fun, I suppose. Because uh, there, was, there was three of those big orange cones around this spot. And um, Jer I, think it was, I think it was you, Jeremy, that told me that someone fell in and got stuck. And then they got out and they wanted to warn people, don't step off here. So they stuck these, these, these cones up. So uh, one thing Jeremy and I talked about is making some signage like, hey, stay, stay along the, uh, the, the bank. Don't walk into the seat because you could sink. And this is a, a very fragile, beautiful habitat as well. But uh, yeah, there's that. That was, that was pretty funny. Um, let's see here. Okay, so that's the communities. We're done with the communities. Uh, let's talk about some of the plants. So uh, vascular plants. So we observed 568 vascular plant taxa. That's a lot, 568. A lot of the reason that that number is so high is because of the communities, because there is, there is so many different communities from a, a very rural or disturbed communities to, to these, these slopes that have these remnant elements to them. So 568 va vascular plant taxa. Uh, 458 of, of that taxa is native. That's about 80%. And that 20% that may seem high, but, um, but it's, it's, it was to be expected, especially in some of these more disturbed habitats. We didn't, we didn't walk around the lawn. You know, the, if you've been to Creek Ridge, there's this big lawn area with a dog park. We didn't do any, anything there. That, that's, a, that's just a lawn and we left it as such. Um, but throughout the, the rest of the system, uh, there were some areas that that were very disturbed and had a, a lot of non-native. Okay, I just removed somebody. Uh, ugh, don't know what that was. Sorry, guys. Um, so we're back. That was exciting. A fun Zoom, a fun Zoom jump in. A little Guns and Roses for you all to wake you up. It's a nice introduction to the 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 vascular plants, though. Um, 
so uh, five, there was so that twenty percent. So overall, the Astor family was the most uh, well represented family, and that's usually the case. There's a lot of different the Asteraceae. Um, that includes the Symphiotrichums, or what we would have uh, previously called the asters, the the sunflowers, and and so forth. Um, and the the most well represented um, plant genus uh, was the oh, Carex, because of course Carex uh, with forty three taxa um, from very conservative species to very ruderal species or disturbance loving species. Um, so, uh, this is something that we look at when we go out and the couple of things, the total mean C, native C, FQA, it means nothing right now. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of talk you through what we're looking at here. And these are two numbers, the 4.2 and then that, that 26.8%. So, um, Willem and Rurika, uh, have these assigned values to each species that occurs in the Chicago region. Um, and they have from zero to 10. Plants with 10 uh, exhibit kind of a high fidelity for, for remnant or undisturbed habitats, where things that are zero are often very disturbing, so they'll probably show up in your lawn, um, or they're non-native. So anything non-native is going to have a zero. And what they what they do is they they mesh these numbers together through this through this system, uh, and then these numbers pop out. And so I'm not going to go through the whole the whole progress of of how that happens right now. Uh, it's just looking at these end results. So seven to ten is our species that lean towards more of an undisturbed uh, uh, area, and we had 26.8 percent of the species fit within that, within that group, which is pretty awesome. It's pretty exciting. Um, the, the total mean C, that's the 4.2 that we see here. So if it's 3.5 or higher, um, then it, it shows that it has uh, marginal remnant qualities. If it's 4.5 or higher, it's, that's when you usually walk into a really nice, like you know this is a pristine area. Uh, so 4.2 is pretty good. That's a pretty close spot. So we're pushing it. So, and that just uh, exhibits a lot of those nice CP areas, those slopes, some of the really nice areas in the, the older dry music upland forests. Um, so something like this, this is, this was out at the site. This is a uh, Viola Restrata, the, um, I think it's called the horned violet. Uh, and that's got a C value of 10, a C value of 10. And then something like this, which is crown vetch, is a C value of zero, of course. It's not native, um, so it's got a C value of zero. So each plant has a has a C value. And again, it's all put together and spits out kind of a, a story. It's not the end all, but it's kind of a story so we can, we can get the feeling for what the site uh, has. One of the cool plants that we saw out at the, uh, out at Creek Ridge, and this is off the trail. You can see the trail there. There's my son hiding. Uh, this is a native honeysuckle, one of our native honeysuckles, uh, Linissa reticulata. Uh, Linissa is named after um, a botanist named uh, Linissa, maybe Adam Linissa. Linissa, I don't remember his first name. Uh, Linissa, Linissa, Linissa. Um, but the grape honeysuckle has a C value of eight. So it's within that, it, it, it predominantly grows in, in more undisturbed um, areas usually. Uh, and I've never caught it flowering. So I was out there and there was a brilliant showing. There's some very large, gorgeous plants. And, uh, and they all, uh, the flowers, as you can see, it was flowering like crazy here. It's a little viney, leggy. So if you've seen uh, Linistra sempervirens or the, the, uh, the honeysuckle, the native honeysuckle that you buy, that's not really native um, in the store oftentimes, um, it has this kind of twining habitat. Uh, and it has these conate leaves, these conate leaves, which means you can see these leaves, especially under the inflorescence, the flower heads on the terminal, so the end of the plant, instead of within the leaf axles, um, they, they're kind of merged together. So these leaves are conate or merged together. So they look like just a plate with uh, the stem going right through it. And there's its distribution. You can see in Indiana, it doesn't have a strong distribution in Indiana, 
Um, so it's kind of fun to, to have it here and to see it. The next native honeysuckle that, that was out there was Linicera dioca, the red honeysuckle. Um, this was another great, really exciting find. Two native honeysuckles uh, growing near each other. Um, this one is named Dioca, actually. It's funny. It gets the name uh, from the word dioecious, which means that the boys are on one flower and the girl parts are on a different separate flower. So it's dioecious. Not... And uh, Linnaeus was like, yeah, this thing's dioecious. So let's name it that. And it's not. It's, it's, um, it's got the boys and the girls all on the same flower. Uh, not separate flowers. So he goofed up about that. So when I get anxiety about misidentifying a plant at night, at least I didn't name it so wrong that it's forever going to be looked at dioecious and it's, and it's not. So, uh, but again, you see those conate leaves. That's, that's characteristic of our native species in the flower heads, the inflorescence are terminal. So they're at the end of the, um, and the reason I'm telling you this and pointing this out is because this is a C value of 10, a C value of 10 in the Chicago region. Um, and this is its distribution um, because this guy's out here too. And this is another vining, twining honeysuckle that's not native. This thing's very invasive and aggressive. Um, you can see its flowers are in the axles. Uh, the flowers are in the axles where the leaves come off of the stem. Um, the lower leaves oftentimes are lobed. If you can see down here, they're lobed. Uh, and um, this is, again, this is very aggressive, uh, invasive species. So being careful if you, if you are a land manager to, to, to make sure that you have this one and not the other two. Um, if it's a really disturbed habitat, you probably have this one. But so uh, that's got a C value of zero, of zero. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, Colone, Colone glabra, the white turtle head. I put this one in because who doesn't love a Baltimore checker spot? This was taken by Matt Beatty when he was out uh, doing some butterfly and bird monitoring out at the site. Um, there was uh, Colone. I used to call it Chalone. It sounds cooler, Chalone. Uh, but um, someone corrected me, Victoria did from Save the Dunes, uh, said, isn't it Colone? I said, no, I don't like that. And I looked it up and it's Colone. I like Chalone better, but I'm wrong. So Colone, and that just means the tortoise. Glabra means smooth. So white turtle head. And that's a host plant for the Baltimore checker spots. And there was a lot of colony out there. So uh, we suspected there'd be Baltimore checker spots. And sure enough, uh, as you can see from the picture, uh, there were. And that's the colony has a C value of eight, putting things in perspective, trying to get you familiarized a little bit with that system. And I don't know what time it is, but we're getting there. Um, so this was another really fun find. So I didn't, I forgot the A at the end of Asclepius verticillata. So Asclepius verticillata is the world milkweed. Again, Asclepius is, I spelled Asclepius wrong too. Unbelievable. It's embarrassing. Um, so uh, at least I didn't name a species Dioca when it's not dioecious. So there's that. Um, so this is more of a, a weedy native milkweed, the world milkweed, Asclepius verticillata. And uh, Feeding on these Asclepius verticillatus out at this site was the unexpected Cisnea moth, Cisnea uh, cholaris, which is state rare. It is, um, it's an obligate, uh, high quality barrens and grassland species. Uh, it overwinters, it's not migratory, so it overwinters in the leaves, fallen leaves of Asclepius. Um, so there was some common uh, milkweed out there too, Asclepius syriaca. Another goof up, by the way, by Linnaeus, because it's not from Syria, Syriaca of Syria. It's not. He goofed that one up too. Um, but anyway, and then they, so the caterpillars overwinter by rolling themselves up in the, in the milkweed leaves. And uh, they, they like monarchs, they rely on milkweeds. They usually, their populations don't spread usually within a hundred yards of the, their larval host plants. And so curiously, if it's a, a, a barren's uh, grassland species, why is it at Creek Ridge? There's no barrens or grassland. It's curious. So what, what it is, is there's this weird spot, and you can see it on the map when you look. It's along 94, kind of. There's this weird spot where there was like, where there's gravel that was laid out. And there's all these disturbing species there. And there's milkweeds and stuff, um, like uh, common milkweed and world milkweed. And because it's kind of a mock barren, uh, gravel barren setup, they have kind of exploited that system and showed up. And uh, so in a quite curious manner, it's using an anthropogenically 
uh, created area as this mock Baron's uh, system. So anyway, a really cool, uh, another milkweed obligate that's not a monarch. So if you see one of these, don't kill it. Love it. Let's see. Oops. Oh yeah, it's got a C value of one, the Asclepius fritisolata. So it's it's definitely on that rural disturbance side. And then this is the, a picture of the barons, or whatever you want to call it, this disturbed gravel spot. A lot of non-natives non there, and a lot of natives as well. And then this guy, oh, this was all over the... So the wild indigo dusky wing is a really cool butterfly that this is the northern reach of its, of its range. Um, I don't know if there's a record of it in LaPorte County. Matt probably has one. Uh, but this is growing all over the place, and it's because it's adapted recently... So it's, it's uh, a Baptisia, um, thus the, the specific epithet. So it's reliant on the Baptisias, which are in the Fabaceae, the, the um, legume family. But it's adapted now to crown vetch. So we have all this crown vetch growing all over the place. And, uh, and, and now the uh, wild indigo dusky wing is spreading its range. It's spreading farther into Michigan now. Um, it's, uh, so it's really, it's really enjoying the one of our introductions. Not that I'm defending crown vetch by any means. It's just kind of a, a cool thing that happened because of this. Okay, so uh, real quick, moving forward to to stay on time uh, as much as I can, I suppose. Um, the other cool finds is things like Luzula cuminata, which is Indiana State Endangered. I was uh, talking to Matt about this little wood rush, Luzula multiflora, and I explained to him that this is the differences between some of these wood rushes, there's, there's only a couple that occur in Northwest Indiana, and one of them you're never going to see because it's only occurs in a couple locations, and that's Luzula cuminata. And sure enough, three steps later, I'm like, oh, there it is. So it was a very fun find. There's things like uh, the pawpaw uh, uh, growing out in the, near, on the, the, the uh, floodplain area where it meets the, the mesic forest, mesic uh, upland forest. Um, there's the princess pine or the uh, Chymophila maculata, which is growing um, in the dry, the dry mesic uplands. And then here's here's the Luzula uh, distribution map. I just thought it was fun to show how it just just sneaks into Indiana just a little bit. And uh, Creek Ridge is one of its its happy homes. So that was that was fun. Sedges, of course, pitch, lots of different style, kinds of sedges, different habitats, lots of different sedges. Um, Wildlife observations, because that's why everyone's here, is they just want me to talk about snakes. Just kidding. Uh, we, we saw 61 species of birds, uh, observed 61 species of birds. Um, that's not a copperhead, by the way, for those that, that go up and down uh, Trail Creek and say they see all these copperheads. They're, it's not. It's a northern water snake. Uh, we saw six species of amphibians and reptiles, uh, five species of mammals. Mammals are one area that we didn't really keep too much, like chipmunks, I think, eastern gray squirrels, red squirrel, basic, you know, stuff that you'd expect to see. We, um, and then we, we, we observed 65 species of insects, spiders, and similar organisms. The insects are abundant there and are underrepresented in the survey, and I highly recommend a formal survey uh, on, on Creek Ridge uh, or Trail Creek as a whole. Um, I think it, it would really benefit to see the dynamics of these plant communities with the insects uh, that use them. So the eastern box turtle, of course, is uh, I dare call it common, but it is it is in the Ambler Flatwoods, Barker Woods, um, and at Creek Ridge. Uh, you can see that there's a mating couple there, and we saw a lot of box turtles out there, which is really cool. It's really fun. Do, you can't take their special concern. You can't take them home and race them. Please don't do that. But um, it was really fun to, to see so many box turtles out there. The broadwing skippers, this is a state-threatened species. Uh, its larval host is Carex lacustris. And this is, it, it was actually up in the, that barrens, the gravel barrens area, um, nectaring on, uh, on melalotus. And, um, and, uh, but it, it was breeding and using those fen, that, that sedge meadow fen, for its breeding area. And I think a lot of the reason is because it's a little wet and soft there, so it's a little more undisturbed. So they have a large enough place where they can where they can reproduce successfully. So that was a really fun find. Uh, we did very preliminary assessment as I'm walking and I see a mushroom, I'll write it down. Um, 
we we there's 43 taxa from 33 different genre of the uh, true fungi. So with that, uh, the next steps and is protection and enhancement of the natural features along the corridor. Enhancement, not gardening. Uh, one thing we try to do as humans is look at a system and, and go, oh, this would look nice here, or this would look nice here. Or, like we should be planting all this stuff. But if we don't have an understanding of the system of this community, of the corridor as a whole, um, all we're doing is gardening and we could actually be hurting the system. So I use enhancement very carefully, um, but protection, protection, protecting as much of the natural feature as possible. Uh, conduct baseline ecological assessments on properties along the corridor. Preferably, if you're paying someone, you know, you can hire me, but there's other, there's other people that could also offer a lot of assistance and help as well. And then followed by land managers creating management plans driven by these baseline assessment results. So those are the next steps. Um, my name is Nathaniel Pilla again. Thank you for entertaining uh, me by sitting, watching me talk. Uh, here's my contact information and my son crossing a ditch. Uh, and on that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will look at the chat for any questions. Let's see, I'm going up, going up. Uh, let's see, not falling asleep. G good, that's good, excellent. Yes, Kathleen, it is remarkable for the acreage. And that's that's one thing that I, I was really surprised at at the conglomeration of the habitats. And when we did a we did a DNR um, heritage survey within the vicinity, and the only the only uh, triggers that we had was a handful of species, and all of them were out of the Trail Creek Fen, uh, but that saved the dune zones um, along Johnson Road. There, that's the only that's the only uh, element occurrences that came back, which really tells me that there's been not a lot of studying on the natural history of this area. And if there has, then they haven't been giving the element occurrences to the DNR, which should be. And I think we were being hacked, by the way. I think because I, I admitted someone who is playing Guns N' Roses. Yes, Nicole. Uh, goodness, I've got to learn how to mute people when we're going. I'm just going through the chats right now. I'm sure you've all seen this. What's going on? Guns N' Roses was. Uh, I guess they, they are from Lafayette. So that was kind of a very Indiana of whoever did that. Um, Best rock show talk. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, oh, yeah. The um, What time of the year does the native honeysuckle bloom? That's a good question. So uh, early June, I would go out um, and you can just, again, walk that trail. It, there's actually a really nice one growing along the boardwalk as well uh, that um, Jeremy pointed out to me. Or was it Richard? I forget. Um, Richard uh, is doing some uh, invasive species control out there. Let's see. Thanks, Shannon. I should have been reading this instead of talking really fast. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. Uh, so they don't assign C values to inventives. That's why it's just, this is a Kathleen. She says, I don't think Wilhelm and Rurika assign C values to uh, inventives. And that's, that's just a zero. It's just put in as a zero. So um, that's the non-native species. So yes, you're right, Kathleen. Uh, <laughs> can't be said, Chad's, but that's fantastic. Good, good, good. Um, was that race or raise? Ooh, um, I don't, Scott, uh, I don't, context, I, possible fundraising opportunity for trail, yeah, I don't know what I was, oh, racing, yes, okay, I see, box turtles. So one thing I've seen when I moved to Indiana, and I, I guess maybe we didn't have this in Minnesota, or I just was completely blinded to it, but you guys have turtle races where you have these kids take these turtles and they write numbers on the back and then they race them. And when I first went to it, I'm like, I don't want to tell the kid, first off, they're kids. I don't want in their dads and moms are there saying, go turtles, go, you know, race, who's winning? But it's like, oh, these are boxed. Oh, what are you doing? These are not. So yeah, they, they actually race turtles. And so don't do that. That's what I'm saying. Just if you know people that do that, just say, hey, you know, very nicely, because I, you know, not around their kids too. Maybe don't do that. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, Nicole, you cannot race them even at Creek Ridge. Did you see the look on that one's face when I, I was even at a distance when I took a picture of them mating, they were, they, he was like, no. No, this is this is private. Get away. And so that was, you know, is what it is. 
Um, how many rare threatened species did you find? So I didn't put that in for a reason, um, mostly because it's, you know, I, the Luzula I talked about a little bit because that's something that isn't, someone's not going to go, oh, I'm going to dig up this, this wood rush and put it in my garden. Um, so, uh, but there was, there was a good number of species. I, uh, and I think there was two or maybe five state threatened or state endangered species out there. A lot of watch list stuff. Um, a couple uh, warblers, um, one that could be a residency there. And that's something that Matt could, Matt Beatty would have more of a, uh, a discussion on with some of the wildlife that was there. Um, and then the, of course, you know, some of the butterflies and such. And can you eat skunk cabbage? I think you can, but you, it smell, it's called skunk cabbage because it smells really bad when you break up the leaves. But if you eat it, you got to eat it when it's just coming up, kind of poking up before it unfurls. Um, but I've never tried it because the smell is, is repulsive. With a side of ranch, the ranch might, might help actually. Uh, please put your contact information in the chat. Great idea. I'm going to do that right now. Uh, and here's my email. There we go. Um, go now I'd lost. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, we're almost there. We're almost to the end. And then um, there is, uh, where are we at? To put you on this, not to put you on the spot. Girl Scouts do a lot of activities. I wonder if you'd be willing to lead them on. Yeah, and actually, um, Jeremy and I have, have talked about doing something out there, uh, be it a hike, be it a program, be it something just to kind of add to the uh, to the site, bring attention to the natural features of the site and how important it, because I think there's an element of responsibility when it comes to sharing this information with saying, you know, use the trail, stay on the trails, pick up your dog poop. You know, if you're fishing there, don't try to cross through the seep. Um, you know, different ways that we can be better stewards of, of our parks. Um, but yeah, let's see. Yes, thank you, Jeremy and LaPorte County Parks uh, for not only funding this program, but, but bringing me on. Thanks for pointing that out, Scott. Um, no, there was, so Ferns, there was, there was, uh, there was, th there was um, a lot, there was like some uh, club moss, the Diphasiastrum digitatum that's growing in the successional areas. Um, Signage is a great idea. I just saw that. Uh, there is, uh, so the question was, did you get a sense of diversity of non-vascular plants, uh, mosses, uh, ferns, etc.? cetera? Um, we did put ferns in with, uh, with the vascular plants. The, for mosses, no, we didn't look at mosses. Same with the fungi. I think uh, it would really behoove um, the site to have a, a bio blitz or something of that nature for, for something like fungi. Or, um, or insects. The only problem and the only trepidation I have with that is there is like this fen sedge meadow system doesn't have anybody going through it. And so that's one reason I think there's such a, a beautiful collection of some of this, some of these insects, because uh, there isn't a lot of disturbance. So it'd be trying to be sensitive about that when you're going, when you're going out. And yeah, yeah, lichens would be another, another great thing to really assess at the site to tell, to tell even a greater story. So so if we were to prioritize the Trail Creek corridor for more basin, what would be our next site? Oh, that's a good question. So I, and actually I zoomed, when I was, when I was doing preliminary work for this, I zoomed out and saw that there was already a lot of natural area along the Trail Creek corridor, both the east and west branches and along the main, the main corridor. Um, it's, all, I mean, throughout there's, I expect, there to be similar structures, different seeps, different, I know that uh, different fence systems, um, different mesic wet floodplain forests and so forth. So I, 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 I would suspect a lot of this overlap, but I'd also expect um, some also some, some different pockets uh, of stuff that, that could be, that could be very surprising. Um, but I don't know. I think, I think that's a, that would be a good conversation to have. And obviously, um, uh, I had a lot of fun doing this and, and wouldn't mind continuing on adding to this. And something like, uh, so a couple of years ago, Shirley Hines Land Trust uh, hired us to do a baseline assessment along the, the east branch of the Little Calumet. And, and we took six sites and then we set them up and compared them with each other. And there was a lot of overlap and there was a lot of originality at each site as well. So, 
So having that that blueprint is is fun to say the least. So yeah. Wow, I think we're doing good. That's 49 minutes. Uh, let's see, is is there a volunteer stewardship group yet? Would the site benefit from such a thing? And I'll let Jeremy maybe talk about that. Um, Jeremy, do you have any comments? Uh, we, we don't have. Um, so, so that's something Nathaniel and I had talked about when we went over this. And one of the things we were, were looking at is to possibly uh, start some programming especially with our neighbors, because there's quite a few places where we're getting a lot of uh, just uh, I don't want to, invasive plants coming across their borders, probably where they trimmed it and threw it over onto us. Or And there's also trash. I mean, uh, Nathaniel found quite a bit of that. So so those are some of the things we're talking about. And, and you know, I, I saw that Jen Birchfield said her, her troop was going to come out and work on trash. So maybe that's something if she'd contact me. And maybe we can get together and look at uh, some of those places Nathaniel found and, and see if that's something we can work on and, and try to get, like I said, if we can get with some of the neighbors and start uh, maybe making them realize what we're dealing with there and, and um, how important it is that they dispose of their trash and plants properly. Um, and, and then, uh, like you said, maybe a volunteer group that we could work with and um, you know, funding was there for the invasive removal. I think we did like 28 or almost 30 acres of invasive uh, removal, initial invasive removal. But with COVID, I don't know how much funding is going to be there now. So um, those are things I'll be trying to look for grants and, and volunteers to work on with us. So, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And that's, and again, I'm, uh, you know, it's, I feel good you know, giving this to Jeremy, this, this baseline assessment, you know, and tr he's entrusting him to, to, to lead the charge. Um, I really trust he's going to do a great job as he has been. Um, so in that, um, I think I'm going to, I'm done unless someone else has a pressing question that they can't live without asking. Um, otherwise you, you have my contact and you got my email. So, uh, send me an email if you have any further questions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, on that, I'm going to give, um, Lauren, do you want, I'm going to give you back the host and I'm going to stop recording at this point. So thanks again for your attention. Thank you so much.